Today on The Breakfast, all marketers' rights federal government proposed to build about 30,000 gas stations to cushion the effect of subsidy removal on petrol. We'll have in-depth analysis as we proceed on the show. Also on The Breakfast, the federal government has barred state, local governments from operating security votes with commercial banks. And don't forget, we'll also be looking through today's newspapers, analyzing the biggest stories of the day. Good morning and welcome to The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. My name is Messia Bopo. We're broadcasting live from our studios right here in Victoria Island in Lagos and the holiday is over. Welcome back to work. Hopefully you're on your way to work. You're probably seated. Then it promises to be an amazing time. Sit back and we will run through the entire show this morning with you. As always, we start off with our top trending conversation and uh, the first on the list. We probably do have, you know, track to this effect. Let's quickly run this. A police officer was filmed assaulting a young man in Port Harcourt. Let's quickly take this one. Well, that's a very uh, sad one. Uh, you saw the video of a police officer who was filmed assaulting a young man that happened in Port Harcourt. Now, if you were not able to hear what happened on the conversation, what he was saying, uh, the guy who was in white, he had his uh, white attire. He was saying, why are you flogging me? Did I steal? And uh, these are the questions, I mean, some of the questions that he was asking. So the issue of police brutality actually continues. That statement was actually made in Pigeon English where the man, you know, collected the cane from the officer who then proceeded to slap him twice on the face. And then he orders him to walk into his car. You could also see him walking to his car. Uh, the second police officer is also seeing rough handling the man's female companion. We can't actually for sure tell whether that's the wife or whatever it is, but uh, you, you, you could see that and they looked very frightened. So, well, it's still unfortunate that two years after young Nigerians held a nationwide protest denouncing the years of extrajudicial killings, torture, and other ill treatment by police officers, especially the anti-robbery squad or unit of the Nigerian police force, uh, as well as the police officers, all of the brutality that's going on over the years. Uh, the story of police brutality is still rampant in Nigeria. So two years and counting, nothing has actually happened for Africa's largest democracy. And that's, and that's really, really, you know, uh, a big shame. Honestly, it's, it's very disgraceful because over time, we're very quick to begin to compare countries and countries. We, we travel, we all have, all, a lot of us, especially the elites, uh, still on this list where, you know, you, you get to travel, uh, go to other parts of the world, and then you see how things are done. So, but there are too many questions that are begging for answers. And one of it for me is that what are the lessons? What lessons did we learn in October? Has justice been served? Yeah, you know, the 2020 October incident where, I mean, it was a mass movement. Why is police brutality still very common? Still, every other day, you still have police officers, you know, treating uh, our citizens, people that they should be friends with as animals. So where 
where are we exactly with the police reforms? These are some of the questions. Do we have legal framework as to all of these behaviors and practices? But it's important to note that the Nigerian constitution or Nigerian constitution prohibits torture or any sort of, you know, that would not be the mode of operandi. And so the Anti-Torture Act imposes a penalty of up, up to 25 years imprisonment for perpetuators. Meanwhile, the Torture Act is an inherent part of, you know, the functioning of the Nigerian police has been documented. So this is not a hearsay, it is an extensive documentation by local civil society organizations, international organizations, media investigations, including United Nations Human Rights mechanisms, all of this. So on a regular basis, you have police officers who use torture as a means to extort. Now, this is not a means of extorting for whatever it is, whether he disobeyed, he did something different. Um, but but you, you could see that. Why are you hitting him? Even if he's a thief and he had asked the question that, did I steal anything? Thinking that, okay, if you're a thief, then you should be treated that way. That's the only reason. That's at the time. But let's also not forget that the constitution would say that you're innocent until being proven guilty. And so if we have laws and specification to this, and I'm sure that the, you know, the rule of engagement for the Nigerian police is not that. Despite all of substantive uh, evidence that it is, all of these substantial evidence that you have implicating police officers, you know, very, very, very rare occasions have you found police officers being prosecuted. Not in, in the recent cases, uh, you have uh, the several human rights consents that have been put out. Human rights abuses by SAS, where you have recent report on human rights abuses by SAS. Amnesty International had documented about 82 cases of torture, ill treatment over three years, and found no instance of police officers being prosecuted. So this brings us to the crux. I mean, some of the questions that we've been asking. What because the, the movement for the NSAS was, was a major in 2022 where people came out to say, hey, we're denouncing the years of police brutality. And so how come you don't have, you know, officers? How many times do we have these officers prosecuted? Do we look at, you know, the laws that we have? The Constitution prohibits all of that. You also have the Torture Act. But hey, we, we, even with all of that, when you have a lot of evidences where uh, police officers uh, are involved and, you know, they are maltreating the people and treating them like animals, whatever the case is, we need to understand what the law says, that everyone is innocent until being proven guilty. But this has been a strategy that they have, you know, always engaged. I know in other times you could see this as such, an, you know, harassment. It is so unfortunate that the police that should be friends of the people, are, you know, in turn are terrorists, are the ones terrorizing the people terrorizing in that sense of, I mean, there's also another video that popped up yesterday of a lady who filmed, and there was a young man who was actually offering to, to pick her up. Even when the guy said, oh, I'm a police officer, well, what exactly was even the lady's confidence? There was no trust. There was no confidence to say, okay, a police officer is, you know, about to give me a lift, and then I should, you know, listen to him. Well, the trust deficit has been lost. And that's because if you follow the reports and all of the investigation, we haven't been big on, you know, prosecution, implementing the laws. We have a lot of laws. But then we act like, you know, what's going on? What happened to reforming the police sectors? Because if people understand that these officers understand that what they're doing is not, you know, uh, best practice, is not, you know, in accordance with the laws and the rule of engagement of the police, including the constitution, and then, you know, there will be a deterrent. But that's not the case. Now, instead, you have police officers who are transferred to other units, are allowed to retire or even appointed to the position in state government. For instance, you remember the Ajar situation where this lady who was just returning from a church service was shot. And what did we hear? That this officer was transferred to another unit. Really, does that solve the problem? I mean, it's just like you're saying you're postponing the issue. You're just moving it to another point. But the thing is, we can't continue like this and expect a different result. It is so saddening. It is totally... Uh, inhuman that every other time you have the police officers, men of the Nigerian police officers and other security personnel who should be protecting the interests of the people, taking advantage of them, abusing them and treating them like animals for whatever it is. Like the law would say, you are guilty, you, I mean, you're still innocent until you're being proven guilty by a court of competence jurisdiction. Now, there's also another conversation that's making the rounds. I mean, yesterday Nigerians talked about that on different social media spaces, but this is also a big one. And, and so there's too many of what if and what could have been. The government of the United uh, Kingdom has placed Nigeria on its red list of countries not to be 
uh, not to be targeted for international recruitment by health and social uh, care employers. I mean, if you're looking for a health job across, you know, that might not just be the case now because the United Kingdom said that this development is coming as the World Bank, I beg your pardon, not the World Bank now, the World Health Organization, WHO, as a last month listed 54 countries, including Nigeria, as facing the most pressing health workforce challenges related to primary and universal health coverage. And that is actually true if you look at it because, I mean, we are grappling with all of this issue. Now, the implication is that the United Kingdom government would accept Nigeria and all the countries on the red list for health and social media care jobs only, on, only based on government and government agreement. The information was contained in the United Kingdom's official uh, website, which is titled Code of Practice for the International Retirement I mean, uh, recruitment of health and social care personnel, that's in England. Now, they also say that this is inconsistent. I mean, it's consistent with the WHO Global Code of Practice Principles and Articles as explicitly called by the WHO Global Code of Practice 10 years review that listed countries that should be prioritized for health personnel uh, development and health system related support provided with safeguarding the, and also discouraging active international recruiters of health you know, personnel. So um, that's actually what the uh, document states. This, these are some of the thoughts of the United Kingdom, but it leaves a lot of question. Don't forget that the House of Representatives recently passed a second uh, reading which seeks to tie down Nigerian trained medical uh, or dental practitioners for a minimum of five years in Nigeria before being granted a full license. So it leaves a lot you know, of questioning. Could this be a collaboration? Don't forget that, hey, they're saying that if we are going to consider, you're on the red list, but if we're going to consider there are a lot of factors that have been put why you're on the red list, I mean, for whatever it is, these countries are sovereign countries, and then it's suspected that you, uh, their sovereignty, whatever they decide to do in their country, is their country. But at the end of the day, don't forget that these are some countries that are big on human rights, they are big on global peace and prosperity. Again, you begin to see some policies, and then you begin to question what exactly happens to some of these treaties and agreements and all of the mounting that we say, uh, does that, this really not infringe on the human right as much as the sovereignty of a nation, especially for uh, the United Kingdom, which colonized Nigeria? Too many questions, you know, begging for all of these answers. But it's leave a lot of people wondering if there's a connection between, you know, the bill that has skilled second reading trying to, you know, trap everyone. Okay, it sounds like trap, but that's exactly what it is. Uh, grant medical license to medical or dental practitioners for a minimum of five years. You have to practice for five years before you're being granted a full license. And then if you look at, you know, the other part of the conversation from the United Kingdom, they're saying that if we're going to consider health practitioners or uh, medical practitioners from this uh, country, especially for Nigeria, then there has to be a government-to-government -government agreement. And some people are saying, hey, this might just be the Nigerian government getting in talks or in bed with, you know, the United Kingdom trying to ensure that this becomes a reality. But fingers are crossed. There's no proof to all of that. It's just, you know, a theory of uh, conspiracy. That's what it is. Now, the next one, I think that those who are very big on borrowing, uh, on these loan apps, uh, there's apparently nothing wrong in borrowing. The only problem is when you do not pay. And on the other hand is people begin to question what you borrow for. For instance, if it's a government, are you borrowing for you know, frivolities or are you borrowing for infrastructure? Do we see what you're borrowing for? However, the Nigerian government has announced that you know, the loan apps on the Play Store will no longer be able to access their users' contact or photos from May the 31st. We're still in uh, April right here, 2023. This policy is in line with the government's recent effort to prevent loan app firms from invading customers' privacy. And I know that, you know, th there's been a lot of outcry because sometimes you have a party. So let's even say uh, Mr. B, you know, decides to take visit one of these loan apps and then he takes credit. And at the end of the day, I am the one who is receiving all of the information. They have my number. They are sending pictures and random messages. And that can be very, very scary. I mean, there was a time I saw someone, I saw a text message saying a certain person is a criminal. Do you know, I was really worried because I knew this person. I'm like, oh, he's a criminal. He's defrauded a certain company and what have you. 
So the federal competition, that, that was actually a very scary one. And a lot of people are not very conversant, I mean, comfortable with the fact that you are invading the people's privacy. And, you know, there's a lot to grapple with. But then, you know, the federal government has done this one. And I think it's, uh, you know, worthy of commendation. So, yes, we say, you know, a bravo to the government, the federal government. The federal government's uh, Competition and Consumer Protection Commission had recently signed registered, I beg your pardon, 170 loan apps out of the 200 operating in Nigeria. However, Google also, it's in collaboration with this one because in April recently, uh, there's a policy of policy update that states a new policy would provide, you know, uh, a way for loan apps users in Nigeria and other places where crude loan retrieval methods have been, you know, a common practice. So the updated policy ob prohibits uh, personal loan apps from accessing users' contact or photos. The policy also introduces additional requirements for, you know, personal loan apps targeting users in Pakistan, uh, including the submission of country-specific licensing and, you know, other issues right there. As the documents prove that the ability to provide or facilitate personal loans is, you know, very apt. I think that Google is also, you know, doing her best to protect uh, consumers or customers' privacy. So the policy follows Google's recent announcement of update in its developed uh, or the developer's program policy. And it, it, this update mandates digital money lenders in Nigeria, uh, not just Nigeria, but you have India, Indonesia, Philippines and Kenya to conform to regulatory rules or face removal from the Play Store by January the 31st, but we are already here, and this is April. So how far has Google fared? How many uh, loan apps have been yanked off? The Play Store is another thing. And what's the government doing? Because in most cases, we have too many laws, but implementation is the case. And so if we follow to the latter, then I mean, it's expected that we get a different result. Uh, it is. We, we understand that when people you know, subscribe to these loan apps, um, there are a lot of conditions, but in most cases, people don't like to pay what they have taken. And that's why uh, these apps and have decided to just take it extra, extra mile, which has been described as crude, which is inhuman, you know, it violates uh, the uh, customer's privacy, however you want to look at it. But hey, this is to you too. If you take money from a loan app, please also have the same energy. Keep it 100. Try and pay back because it doesn't make any sense. Uh, for you to behave in that way, it's, it, it's not fair. You think about it. So for the next time you subscribe to taking uh, cash from a loan app, whatever it is, you don't need uh, these loan apps to begin to take pictures of you and have access to your contact and begin to distribute it across saying that you're a criminal, that you're a thief. Because <laughs> the last time I saw that, I mean, it took me some months before I realized this was what was going on because I was like, oh my God, so this person is a thief? How come he defrauded the company? You know, it was so scary. And then I tried to reach out, but the number wasn't connected. And then there's a lot of confusion in my head, but it's a good one. And uh, we also say that, hey, you need to do better. Live up to your responsibility. Take responsibility for your actions. That's the size of it this morning on our Top Trending. We'll just take a quick breather. When we return, Chris Kane and Wandu will be joining us this morning for Off the Press. Good morning. <laughs>